Amen. How we doing? You're, you're not sure how you're doing. Okay. Well, it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood, so um, we're glad you're here and uh, want to give you an opportunity really quickly to finish filling out your prayer cards. If you haven't already done that, go ahead and finish doing that. Our prayer team will come by and get those now. And uh, while we're doing that also, uh, we can be opening our Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we're going to be picking it up in verse 13. We're going to do something a little uh, different than normal. We're not going to stand as we read God's Word uh, this morning. And um, we, we do that uh, out of respect for God as we read His Word to kind of give us that sense of uh, honor that He deserves, and so uh, we love to do that. Uh, we don't feel like we have to do that, um, but uh, we're going to read a lengthy passage uh, today. We're actually going to uh, read the rest of chapter 4, and we're going to read about half of chapter 5, um, and uh, the reason why, and many of you know this, and probably all of you know this, but uh, the Bible, when it was written, uh, did not include chapters and verses, okay? So those things were added later for us to kind of get our bearings where things are and, and be able to reference, you know, the different scriptures and a very helpful tool. But uh, the, the addition of uh, a chapter break right in the middle of this teaching, I think, is unhelpful. Um, so we're going to uh, go all the way through and read this together because it really holds uh, together, this, this issue of the return of Christ, the day of the Lord, all the things that happen involved in that. Now, uh, before we dive into our scripture, let me just give you a little bit of a, um, a recap, so to speak, of what's going on in the Thessalonian church. If you've been with us last couple of weeks or, or either of the last two weeks, then you know this, but if you haven't, then you may not know this. Uh, but the Thessalonian church uh, was heavily persecuted, uh, violently, aggressively, continually for a long time. Uh, this is the situation they lived in. And so because of that, uh, they had particular uh, feelings and thoughts about um, being uh, spared uh, that the Lord would return, that uh, God would uh, relieve the pressure that they were under, and uh, they were very desperate for that, hopeful for that, uh, longing for that. And so uh, in First and Second Thessalonians, the return of Christ is mentioned or explained uh, in every chapter. Every chapter in First and Second Thessalonians uh, either refers to the return of Christ or goes into detail about the return of Christ and there's a reason for that. It's because these people needed uh, some encouragement. And so two different times in the passage that I'm going to read, uh, Paul uh, refers to this issue of encouragement. Encourage one another with these words. Encourage uh, each other uh, as you are doing. Build each other up and remind each other of these truths and, and make sure that you uh, remember that there's a, a goal here that God is going to bring about uh, relief, and He's going to do some great things, and, and so we can continue to persevere as we understand that God's working all things out for our good and for His glory, but it's not always easy, right? And so the three main things that I see in this passage as we're exploring the return of Christ that He's trying to encourage them about, uh, one is hope in death, hope and death. And how many of you know that uh, if the Lord doesn't return in your lifetime, uh, then you're going to die? Three people know that. Okay, the rest of you, I remind you that, you know, that's it's very likely, okay? Uh, and then the other thing is uh, they need some hope uh, about justice, that justice will be done. And uh, anybody else look around the world and say, um, man, <laughs> this world is crazy and there's a lot of evil going on, and why doesn't God, you know, take care of this, and why does He allow this, and the problem of pain and suffering and, and the, the victims in the world that are just being crushed under the weight of, of all the oppression, and anybody else, or is that just, okay, so question, like, is there hope for justice, or, or what's going on? Um, and then the third thing that He encourages them about is, is uh, the hope for life. Does my life mean anything? Is there meaning to why I'm here? 
Uh, is that an important question for us to answer? Okay, so those are the three things that we're going to explore as we look at the return of Christ. And so, uh, you can remain seated as we read uh, 1 Thessalonians, starting in chapter 4.13, um, and this is what it says. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, or ignorant uh, about those who are asleep. Now, every time it's talking about um, those who have fallen asleep or those who are asleep, uh, you know, we're going to understand he's talking about Christians who have died or passed away, right? Uh, So we don't want you to be uninformed about those who are asleep, uh, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first." Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Now, concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, we have no need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in the darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief, for you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, uh, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day... Let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with Him. Therefore, encourage one another, build one another up, just as you are doing. And Father, we pray that uh, we, as a church... As believers, uh, would take that encouragement to heart, Lord, to build each other up, build each other up in faith, build each other up in hope, build each other up in trust, Lord, in our worship and our love for you and our love for one another, support one another as we all are pressing on toward the goal, which is a deeper relationship with Jesus. Uh, more people included in the kingdom, Father, that salvation would be at hand and that more and more people would uh, reach out and receive the awesome gift that you've given us in your son, Jesus. And Father, that uh, we would not grow weary or uh, that we would not be disappointed, that we would not uh, be discouraged, Father, but that we would continue uh, to strive for greater things believe greater things and trust that your hand is at work in all these things to accomplish uh, all that you want to, Lord. Um, We sit here and think and wonder and and question all the things in the world and even the things in our own life, and Lord, we know we can trust you, that you're with us, you care for us, that you have uh, big plans for your creation. You've included us in that through faith in Jesus Christ, that you've made it possible, Lord, that you've made it not only possible, but that we can have confidence, that we can be assured, that we can be uh, really, (laughs) um, totally, and and utterly just at peace, knowing, Lord, that you are in control. And uh, Lord, our lives do have meaning, and not only do they have meaning, but Um, Lord, you want and desire and call us uh, to be included in the continuation of your plans and purposes uh, in this world. Lord, we pray that you would encourage believers, but also that you would uh, begin to stir up in those who are um, maybe not yet quite ready or uh, haven't been ready to trust you. For whatever reason, whatever doubts, whatever experiences, Lord, of life have have, uh, brought them to a place where they just are not quite sure, 
Lord, I pray that today uh, would be the day of salvation, that you would begin to solve and settle all those doubts and questions and begin to apply and, and uh, stir up and grow faith in their heart because of your awesome, glorious, and wonderful love for us. We depend on it, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. So, one of the things that you notice right away um, is uh, how he begins. We don't want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. And uh, just thinking about that issue itself, is there hope in death? What is our, our hope about people who have died? Um, and I just go back to this uh, issue. I think they are dealing with it. We deal with it. There's a question. There's a mystery. There's a, a certain amount of fearful expectation about what happens when people die. And, and uh, it's hard for us to uh, know and have complete confidence about that. And um, by the grace of God and, and by His uh, uh, call uh, on my life, I've had uh, the opportunity to preach and uh, to officiate funerals for people who uh, have been uh, magnificent uh, witnesses for Christ and uh, people that I've come to know and love dearly and been able to, uh, with confidence, say, <laughs> Um, you know, as far as I could possibly know or any person could possibly know, I have absolute confidence that this person is in the presence of the Lord for eternity, and there's no doubt about that. And when I uh, have those chances to be in the pulpit for those types of situations, I tell you, no matter how much I love that person, how much I've known that person, it is always uh, infinitely easier to preach that sermon than to be in a situation where the person who died did not know the Lord and the family are not believers. Infinitely easier. I mean, I could have tears streaming down my face talking about this dear Christian person who I believe is with the Lord. Um, it's nothing compared to having to stand in front of a group of people who have utterly no hope. And the opportunity to share the gospel is an awesome thing in that situation, and that's what I pray that I do um, effectively. And sometimes, you know, the Lord will take that gospel message and, and work on somebody's heart, and, and that's an amazing thing, and I believe that's the whole point. Um, but I tell you, the despair is almost palatable uh, when you come into those situations. Um, the, it's, it's like a heavy weight of dread. And uh, people are so overwhelmed with grief because there's no hope. Now, whether or not they try to reconcile in their minds that maybe this person has a chance for eternity or whatever they may think, their minds are, this person is gone and uh, I, I don't know what to believe about eternity. I have never really delved into the scripture or into my spiritual life and they didn't either. And now I'm hearing from this pastor who's talking about, you know, Jesus and all those things, but what does that mean for them? And I mean, have you ever been in those situations? It's just so hard. I, I do not want to be in those situations, but uh, the need for a Christian witness in those uh, opportunities is so huge. Um, that's what's going on here to some degree. The, the people uh, that were in Thessalonica had been um, trained to believe, to think that death was an utterly despairing event, that it, there was no hope in death, that the Roman culture, the Roman uh, belief about a person who died was so stark and dreary and unhopeful and the people uh, of the day in Thessalonica were kind of infused with that idea. It's just, they, they had Christian people, okay, who were coming to know Christ, receiving Christ, getting saved, uh, and yet this uh, continued to be on their minds. What if they died before Jesus returns? Are, are they lost? Is it over? Is that, does that mean that they're not going to experience eternal life the way that we understand uh, that uh, we've been promised, that we've been given, and uh, they had that uh, infused into their mentality. Now, here's the, the quick, okay, 
practical issue that we have to deal with. Um, what are the cultural things that we're being taught, influenced, hearing, reading, seeing, and are accepted around us, even as Christian people who uh, have the Word of God and, and are worshiping together and believing the things of, of God's Word, uh, but we're still being influenced by our culture and steering us into maybe some difficult or, or maybe uh, some challenging thought processes when it comes to, well, the Bible says this, but this is what I experience. I may not have made a whole lot of sense about that just yet, but let me just ask you about this. There are hundreds of things that our culture teaches that Christian people are, are we're, we're like fish in a tank. We're surrounded by it. We're constantly being bombarded by it. And uh, I tell you, it, it does influence the way we think. And uh, the one thing, I mean, we could talk about so many things, but the one thing that I thought, man, how is this impacting Christian people um, is entitlement. You know that we're very entitled? Do you, you see that in our culture? You hear that? You kind of, I mean, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican or whoever you love for president or hate or whatever you think about all that stuff, there's, there's a sense of entitlement that uh, on one side, uh, society owes me something and they should provide it. And uh, it's not just the basic necessities. It's like all the luxuries. If you have it, then I should have it. If you have a phone, then I should have a phone. If you get to have $5, you know, a coffee, then I should have $5 coffee. And if, I mean a cup of coffee, not a bag of coffee. Uh, or, you know, it's like, well, capitalism, that should provide these things, and you work hard for it, and you get it. And, but the, it's the same basic mentality on either side. I mean... What we see is that capitalism actually seems to uh, allow that to happen in a lot of people's lives, whereas socialism uh, doesn't. <laughs> uh, but the issue is simply this, that we as Americans, and I know a lot of you are like, stop talking about politics, uh, but we as Americans um, are so influenced by this idea that I deserve that I should have, that it should be mine. Now, here's what happens. When that mentality comes into the, the basic structure of the mass majority of people as Christians, then we start to apply it to God and in this way. We begin to think that God owes me something, that uh, He should make me happy and uh, He should... Uh, prevent anything bad from happening in my life and, and uh, everything that, that uh, I desire in my life and my dreams and, and my wishes and my prayers, they should all be answered with the affirmative, yes, of course, here, I, I'll give you all the, you know, I'll spare you from any pain and I'll heal every disease and I'll, I'll make sure that your marriage is great and I'll make sure your kids never rebel. And, and I'll tell you that uh, because of that mentality among Christian people, uh, we have begun to create a false God that we believe that unless God uh, answers all these things and makes all these things happen and, and in my life, that He must not be very good. And we just keep striving uh, for all these things, but we're not striving for God. We're striving for what we hope and believe God can give to us. And what we know, okay, as many of us know, if we avoid sin and the things that God says are wrong and the wrong way to get about things and the wrong way to do things, the wrong way to think, then we will have more peace and we will have more physical health. Uh, we will have a better chance at a healthy marriage and we will have a better opportunity to have godly children. But we don't have a guarantee that all these things are going to be handed to us because we're Christians. Do you hear what I'm saying? It's but so many of us are seeking after the things that we want from God instead of God. Like, I want God in my life. And I do believe He will help me in many of these areas, but I know that this world is trouble. It's full of trouble. It's difficult. I still am fallible and weak and do the wrong things and say the wrong things. And I will suffer for some of those things. Thank the Lord, not eternally. But in this world, we will have what? 
trouble. But praise be to God because he has overcome the world. And so this issue that the Thessalonians were dealing with, we still deal with. We have this question, and, and the reason why we have this question about eternity is because um, for some bizarre reason, we think that we deserve heaven on earth now. So we put off what happens when we die because we really don't want to face the, the idea, the fact that we're not made for this world. This is not where we were intended to be. We were intended to be in a close, unified relationship with God with perfect purity for all eternity. And we're traveling through the present state of things to get to that. But many Christian people, okay, I'm not talking about the world, I'm talking about Christian people have camped out in the world and put all their hope on having a nice, quiet life full of every luxury that we can imagine. And as Americans, do we have a lot of luxuries? A lot of opportunities, so much, you know, uh, that we've been uh, blessed to have and to be able to do and freedoms and We have to consider that we're not really meant for this world. Um, we just have a job to do for a limited amount of time. Okay, I'm preaching pretty hard. I think you're getting it. I will move on. Here's what uh, the promises um, are all about here. Um, I remember I said when he says asleep, he's talking about a euphemism for uh, people who in Christ have died. Um, what I, I learned um, just, I think, last year, I never knew this, never really researched it, understood this, uh, but through uh, a book by Dr. Uh, David Jeremiah, Book of Signs, some of you have read it, some of you have it, we have taught it here. Uh, great book, if you're interested in end time stuff, uh, very readable, but he says in one chapter, and I never pick this up just in my reading of the New Testament, but he says in one chapter that the reason why the asleep language is so prevalent and is because after the resurrection of Jesus, from that point on, uh, there is never again a simple statement in the New Testament that says a Christian died. It doesn't ever say it that way. It always says they're asleep, that they, uh, are, they died in Christ, that they died in the Lord, that and those who are dead in the Lord, and, and he's always qualifying the fact that people who die after the resurrection of Jesus, that they actually don't die because death means separation, right? Death means separated from God, separated from yourself, separated from each other. And so what happens in the resurrection is that there is now the possibility, if not the absolute assurance, of a unity when you die. So a Christian doesn't die. Do you remember us talking about that some time ago? A Christian doesn't die. They go from life to what? Life. To life. Life to life. We go from physical life to eternal life. And then what happens, which is even more amazing, is that God is going to restore us to our better than creation. We were created to have a physical body and a soul. You know that? I mean, we should know that because how we are. But in the beginning, God created a body. He gave him a soul, and that is his intention. Before there was sin in the world, his intention for humanity was to be body and soul. That's a unity in that what happens in the resurrection is that no longer are we disembodied spirits in the presence of the Lord, which is, will be wonderful. I'm looking forward to that. But in the resurrection, we go from life to life to even greater life, glorified human existence. Glorified human existence, which means that the body that you have, how many of you are just absolutely in love with everything about your body? Okay, I, most people, there may be a few here that are just like, yeah, I got it all going on. <laughs> but most of us have a little bit of insecurity about something, whatever it might be. You know, I, I have a pimple on my nose right now. I don't want to draw attention to it, but every time I get some blemish, it's going to happen close to the weekend. That's just how it's going to go. It reminds me, like, 
I just, yeah, there's problems. And that's the least of my problems, let me, you know, assure you. But we're like, man, in glory, perfect. I mean, are you looking forward to that? Perfect. Never again any even ounce of self-consciousness about how we look, how we feel about ourselves. I mean, I don't know. I think that's going to be pretty awesome. But in the meantime, we just are walking through, struggling through our finite, fallible, corrupted, you know, fallen world with a fallen body, longing for what is going to be. So he assures them over and over, death, don't worry about that. There's no fear in death because actually what's going to happen is you're going to be with the Lord, and then the Lord, when he returns, those who have uh, fallen asleep or died in Christ uh, before he returns, they're going to be with him because they're with him now because he paved the way through his resurrection, through his death and resurrection. He made it possible for everyone to be in the presence of the Lord who will receive him. And so you go from life to life, and then you'll never be separated from him. He says, we will always be with the Lord. And so they will come back with him. And those who are alive, remember what we said about uh, rapture? All rapture is, is the idea, and it's all through Scripture. You see a lot of occasions of this where people go to heaven without dying. So in the return of Christ, what's going to happen is that there will be living Christian people who will go to heaven without having to experience death, physical death. And so those who have gone to be with the Lord previous, those who are still on the earth, will all come together in the sky and be with the Lord forever, and then we will receive our new, resurrected, glorious body that will be something like how Jesus is, probably not to the extent, but something like it. Read through the Gospels, read through the resurrection uh, accounts, and see the things that Jesus can do. I'm not saying you'll be able to do all those things, I don't know. But uh, he can appear in rooms without having to open doors, and he can be one place and then appear. I'm looking forward to the uh, idea of um, flying. I think we'll be able to fly. Do you think that? I just, like Superman, I just think that would be cool. Okay, I don't know. That's, forget I said that, that's not, okay. I mean, we will fly. We'll meet him in the air, so. <sighs> now we got to get serious for a minute, okay? Justice. Um, will there be justice in the world? <sighs> verse 3, chapter 5, verse 3. While people are saying there's peace and security, um, it isn't just that people are saying there is peace and security. It's that this is their hope. If we could just get our government figured out, if we could just, you know, get a, a vaccine or cure for cancer or, you know, if economically the you know, stock market would keep going up instead of having all this, if we could just get, you know, these things figured out, if we could just get the kids educated, if we could just get enough resources for the poor, if we could just get, you know, the, the climate under control and, you know, then we'll have peace and security. We just... Instead of, you know, I mean, I don't know about you, but I trust the Lord. I I know that the world is topsy-turvy and there's a lot of crazy stuff going on, but um, our our point is this, that God's in control. He's in control. And uh, we're living in a time uh, where there's so much, um, there's so much pain. Do you know that? You know how much pain there is in the world? You see this, and I, I cannot wrap my mind around it. I just i am having a hard time with wrapping my mind around the, the idea of human trafficking. The millions, millions of young people, women, even young men uh, who are being kidnapped and forced into uh, human trafficking, sex slave trade. Millions of them around the world, which means that there are, and I'm just going to use a rough calculation, hundreds of millions of people involved in their abuse. Would you, I mean, is that too far? A billion? 
How many people are involved in uh, the tragedy of rape and murder and abuse and kidnapping? And I mean, if you have a child, I, I don't know of anything that I could possibly experience that would be worse than my child being taken from me and not knowing where they are or what's happening to them. I would rather be tortured physically and killed and treated personally than to have that happen to somebody that I love and not know what's going to happen to them. Can, do you, you follow me there? Justice in the world. What's going to happen? Why does God allow this? And what, what is he going to do about it? And shouldn't he do it now? And, and here's what the Bible clearly teaches, okay? Justice is going to happen. It has to. God, in his righteousness, in his uh, holiness, has to punish sin and wickedness and abuse and atrocities. He has to. He would not be good if he didn't. If he just said, meh, that, that would not be a good God. It would not be a holy God. Um, there's no way that God would allow that to happen, to just let people get away with the types of things that they're getting away with. Now, uh, when Jesus returns, this is what's going to happen. He says, like a thief in the night. Um, if you just want a little bit of the chronology here, this is what we believe, and, and I'm not saying I speak for everybody because we have different opinions, even in this church. Uh, but I believe Jesus is going to return uh, in the sky, and we're going to go meet him in the air. And the church is going to be taken out because the wrath of God must be poured out on the earth for the wickedness that has been perpetrated on the earth. And it says, God has not destined us for wrath. Okay, you understand that God will not pour wrath out on his children, on those who have received Christ. He won't pour his wrath out on them. So somehow or other, we can't be here when that happens. Then after the tribulation, you read Revelation, after the tribulation, then... Uh, there will be the great day of the Lord, and it'll all be done. And then the wicked will be resurrected for the final and complete judgment where they're thrown into the lake of what? Fire. That was not made for them. It was made for dev the devil and his demons. Uh, but they will be placed there uh, because they followed Satan and his demons. And they refused to receive the grace and mercy and forgiveness that was poured out on the cross. And here's what I want to tell you, is that, and here, I'm going to step into, this is my opinion, and uh, I may f think or feel differently about this at some other point, I, I can't tell you for sure, uh, but my understanding, my belief is that God is not gleeful about pouring his wrath out on um, humanity. It's not looking at that, you know, with joy. Like, oh boy, I can't wait for the day I get to do that. I think Scripture clearly points to the reality that uh, he is uh, hesitating on that for the full number of people to come into his kingdom because his desire is that none should be lost. None should be lost. He does not look at that with longing, like, oh, I just can't wait. He's looking at that with a certain amount of um, sadness that it's necessary, because in, in some sense, uh, it shouldn't be necessary, because he already poured his wrath out on the cross on his own son, that anybody and everyone who would receive Jesus Christ, trust in his sacrifice and who he is as a savior, could be spared that fate. Amen? But the wrath will be poured out because there are Unfortunately, many people um, who through pride, uh, through uh, rebellion, through sinful ignorance, just will not bow. I mean, I'm telling you, it is it's heartbreaking. Um, God loves these people. I mean, I don't understand it. I just don't. It's hard because we are not God, but he, he looks at that murderer, child molester, drug dealer, the, the serial killer. He looks at a pedophiles, at wife beaters, at the adulteress. He, he looks at them with love. 
And I know, and like, it's hard for me to even say that. I just, I feel there's sometimes like this sense like justice should be done and it should be done immediately and how dare they and, but what about me? And what about you? What, what, you like, you want justice? Anybody raise your hand if you want justice. How many of you think like it should be done immediately? Like you harm a child, boom, you're dead. I mean, that's my thought, but but here's the reality. You're all so reluctant to raise your hands. I'm kind of glad about that, although I think you're being dishonest, but that's fine. <laughs> but the reality is this. If that were the case, and justice was done immediately, none of us would be here. You, you, we wouldn't be here. The love and the graciousness and the mercy and the forgiveness of God, His long-suffering patience with us means that He's given us time and opportunity and a chance and to repent so that we could be forgiven. And maybe you haven't done any of the things that I've mentioned. Maybe you have. There's still forgiveness there. There's still the grace of God that would be lavishly poured out on you if you had received Christ. It's available. It's, it's not only for the people who are pretty good. I think sometimes in the church, we, we start to feel like we're pretty good. God, I haven't done too much really bad stuff, and we start to be full of like our own, what would that be called? Pride, self-righteousness. And I, I fear for that because I think that that's a bigger problem than just being a blatant sinner who is, comes to the point of forgiveness. To think that I've somehow achieved some personal holiness with God that He looks at me more favorably because I'm not as bad as the other guy. I think there's a story or two in the Bible about that. It's It's dangerous. So God wants to forgive. He longs to forgive, restore, heal, cleanse, and bring about perfection through Christ. And so this is what brings us to this last uh, hope, the hope for life. What is, is my life? Does it mean anything? Does it have any value? Is it worthwhile? Or what's the point? You ever think that? I mean, we have these questions in our minds about the meaning of life. I mean, this is the age-old question. Is there meaning to your life? They, I think we're struggling with that to some degree. Um, what, what's this all about? Why not just go directly to heaven? And that, that question has been posed by so many people throughout the centuries, and here's the, the reason uh, why we're here. We're here to uh, be part of God's rescue team. We are, in some sense, first responders to those in the world that need to hear and see and experience the love of Christ through people who have also received the love of Christ. And so we rush into dangerous places. We live in a hostile environment, um, not just trying to you know, survive Anybody ever feel like that? I feel like that so often. I'm just trying to survive and get along and, and not cause problems. And, and if I could just kind of walk through really carefully, maybe I won't have the kind of issues that other people have. And God calls us to walk into burning buildings. Where would we be without our first responders? Our police, our military, our firefighters, our EMTs, etc., who, who rush in when there's danger. Because when they don't, then what happens? More people die. More people are harmed. And we need those people. And I'm telling you that Christian people are that. We're on that team for the Lord in our homes, in our workplaces, in our community, in our schools, Wherever we go, we are like first responders. We're not doing it for our own benefit. We're not sharing our testimony because we get something out of it personally. Like, I'm going to be more respected because I tell people I believe in Jesus. Does that happen a lot of times? Not so much anymore. 
Maybe at one point it might have, but these days, not so much. You walk into your school, and you profess to be a Christian, and you're going to follow the Lord, and I'm going to do the things that He wants me to do, because my mind is set on this. It's not about my will. It's about His being done. It doesn't matter what my opinion is versus your opinion, my, my preferences versus your preferences. It's about what does God think about that? What does God think about that? How does He want me to live? And you begin to live that way, think that way, work and, and uh, exist like that. Everything comes back to, I, I just want to believe what God you know, tells me about these things. What He tells me about me, what He tells me about you, what He tells me about how to, to, to you know, handle the things that come in and out of my life. It's God's will be done. It's His thoughts and His purposes, His plans. And you begin to walk into a, a dark workplace, a dark school, even a dark home, and you begin to do those kinds of things, are you going to cause problems? I mean, it's going to cause some problems. People don't love that. Uh, It's going to cause some rejection. People are not going to love you for being that way because we're reminded. I'm reminded when I come into contact with a Christian person who's uh, more committed to serving the Lord than I am. Man, I need to get my act together. Anybody else? Like, it's not just I'm being judged. They don't have to judge me. They just live faithfully for the Lord. And sometimes that's encouraging to me. And sometimes it's like, man, I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm, I've kind of settled into being comfortable. Easy to do. Purpose, meaning of life is, um, I'm going to tell you a couple of things. One, there's so much mystery and wonder and good and joy that can be had in this world. As believers, we have the opportunity to experience and appreciate the magnificence of how God created things and how He created us specifically to enjoy things His way. I mean, just driving down the road, I'm so thankful to live in an area where there are bald eagles. Just telling you, I, I'm fascinated by them. I see them. They're so awe-inspiring. Just, just a bird <laughs> God created, and they're just marvelous. You drink a good cup of coffee. I'm not talking about slamming down a bunch of coffee so you can stay awake. <laughs> I'm talking about enjoying a good cup of coffee. Anybody with me? Like, just, just a pleasure. Harmless pleasure, to experience joy in a child's laugh, just that they, they find so much excitement and wonder in the, the simplest thing. I mean, when we, um, when our kids were smaller, and we took them to Disney World, it, it, was, it was so fun to see how they were just Everything was like, wow. And then you get a little older and try to go, and now it's just like trying to get through the crowds. And I got a fast pass over here. I got to hurry up. And, of course, that's my fault. (laughs) But uh, just to have the joy of uh, just a a marriage that's thinking on the same page and, and working together towards the same goals and just to be able to have comfortable um, conversations. Just the joy of that. I mean, we can go on and on. I mean, there's so much that we experience that as Christians we take for granted, but that we have the opportunity to just value. And here's what happens to a lot of people is we get so caught up in what we think we deserve that we miss out on what we have. Do you know what I'm saying? There's a meaning to that. It gives God glory when we appreciate what He's actually done in our lives. And to do that knowing that there's something even better coming can be awesome. Paul talks um, later in another place about being uh, just content, just being content working quietly with your hands and just being
peaceful and peaceable and getting along, not trying to, you know, change your situation, just being content. And there's a, there's a value in that, that, and here's what I tell people, because I think a lot of people are like, I need to do something for the Lord, and I need to change my life, and I need to go on the mission field, and I need to do this, and, and uh, I'm telling you that every single person here has a mission field where you live and where you work and the people that are around you right now. You don't have to relocate or quit your job or go somewhere else, okay? There's so much to do right where you're at. And just to know that you can have an impact. I mean, how many of you have been affected by just one person who just was a faithful believer? Just, and they didn't push it down your throat and they didn't try to convict you and they weren't beating you up over your sin. They just were a confident, loving, just a faithful example of what it means to be a Christian. You're like, that's where most of my Um, experiences have been with my personal growth. Somebody, as a believer, lived it out authentically, and I saw it, and I'm like, that's that's what I want. You know what I'm saying? You can you can do that. It doesn't take theological training. It doesn't take you, you know, spending tons of money. It just means I'm gonna authentically live my faith wherever I'm at. You start to have an impact on just one person around you. And it, it can be the world to them. It can be everything. That this person, um, they believed in me. They loved me enough not to give up on me. They forgave me when I messed up. And they showed me what it means to be a Christian. Amen? We're, we're here for a short time. We're here for, I mean, if you live to be 100, that'd be fantastic. Let's just say you got 100 years. How much more time you got? You know? It's so small. It's so finite for any one of us. It's just such a, a glimpse of eternity. And I'm telling you that the meaning and the value of life is not to get everything you can for yourself. The meaning of life, the meaning of what God has put you here for and what he's calling us to is to live it out for other people to also be part of the kingdom. Somebody, anybody, everybody around you to see it and to have the same chance to turn and return to Christ and receive the forgiveness that you have and the same united relationship that you have with the Lord to be able to help somebody grow in that. That's what life's about. And if you're missing that because of something else, then go back and read uh, 1 Thessalonians. Go back and and just uh, spend some time with the Lord in prayer uh, because we get so caught up in so many things that God says, that's not important to me. Sometimes I think that I'm so worried about something and God's just like, Really? You're worried about that? And I got this person over here who, uh, who's going to hell? I'm going to, to heaven. No matter what happens in this life, I'm going to be with the Lord forever. He's going to pour out glory and wonder and awe for eternity. And yeah, we might suffer for a little while. Um, it's nothing. Paul says uh, that uh, the momentary afflictions that we experience are nothing in the light of his glory. And I'm telling you, he was a guy who suffered greatly. Amen. He knew whatever I experience, it's nothing compared to the wonder that we're going to have in the presence of Jesus for all eternity. I'm inviting you to respond to the Lord. He's calling you. He's inviting you to himself to share that experience with him. He longs for you to know him like like that. If you don't know him like that, then let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you've uh, provided You've made it possible that you have done 
everything. Lord, you lived the perfect life. You were the perfect sacrifice. You were willing. Just, it's amazing to think that uh, not only uh, were you able because you were perfect, but you were willing because of your love and your goodness, Lord, to lay it down on the cross, receive the wrath that we deserve so that we didn't have to ever experience the wrath ever. And yet we so often are unwilling to uh, turn to you, think that life has better things or that we're we, we're going to lose our freedom or we're not going to be able to do some things that we want to do or it's going to be restrictive. And Lord, we know, and it takes time to learn this. Living with you is so much better. Anything we ever experienced in our sin. But Lord, I pray right now that your spirit would just touch any and everyone who needs you, who resists the thought that they need you, Lord, would you speak to their heart? Would you speak to their minds right now, to their soul? And would you call them by name? Would you show them your love and your grace? Would you reveal to them that you are so good and they are so valued by you? There's nothing to fear by saying yes. Father, I pray that you would encourage your church, Lord. Bless your people who do know you, Lord, that they might uh, find the strength to continue and not only continue, but to thrive with joy, with meaning, wherever they're at, to know that, Lord, (laughs) you're in control. And you have better plans, wonderful plans, Lord. We thank you that you've included us in those, and we pray that you would continue. Uh, Be patient with us. We know that you are. Have mercy. So slow, Lord, we are to receive all that you have, but Lord, we pray that we would. Now, continually, increasingly, Lord, receive all that you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen.